Well, good morning to the First Baptist family and to the friends of First Baptist who are logging on to this Facebook premiere event. Let me continue to encourage you two things. If you're a part of the First Baptist family, set a date, set a goal about when to return. I keep harping on that idea, but I think if, if we've learned nothing else this last year, is that we desperately need community. We need people around us. And so uh, as we continue to emerge from COVID, I am asking you to consider, put a date on the calendar and consider a day when you will return to in-person worship. Now, also, what we do on Facebook is very intentional because we are sharing only the message because then it is highly shareable. And you might know other people in your community, in your neighborhood that you might know need to hear a certain message on a certain day so you can send it directly to them or you can repost this on your timeline as a way of very intentionally and purposefully sharing the good news. So let's, let's come together today around God's Word. And I want to take us back to the beginning of the year. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul talks to the church at Corinth. It's a very uh, kind of a sideways church, very dysfunctional in many ways, but he loves them deeply. And he doesn't know what else to say except this, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. I am pressing hard after Jesus. And so with all the different issues that we face, follow me as I follow Christ. And so that's been my call to our church uh, in this time of uh, unusual cultural currents, um, odd social things going on, especially with COVID. Um, we we kind of live in a messy world right now. And not that I'm perfect, not that I'm the example, but as your pastor, I'm doing my dead level best to follow after Jesus. And so I'm asking you to follow me as I follow Christ. And living that out this year, uh, I'm just asking some questions. First question of the year was, what in God's name are we doing here? When we gather to worship, what, what are we doing here? And we've talked about worship, and my hope is that as you return to in-person worship, you will see a vibrancy, an intentionality that you did not see before you left, before COVID shut everything down. Listen, worship is one of the most selfless things we can do. Worship, we, we worship because it pleases God. We worship because it encourages others. We also worship because it fulfills the purpose for which we were created. So there, there is a little bit of, of self-satisfaction in that, but, but generally it's about God, it's about others. And I hope that you experience a new vibrancy as we worship together. I was listening to a pastor a few weeks ago who said, I would never want to become that, that two-by-four that stands in worship anymore. I want us to open our hands to open our hearts, to open our voices, to open our lives to God, and to experience His transforming power in worship. Then I've asked the question, why has God put us together? Either a church is a collection of individuals, or God has providentially, knowing what each of us needs and caring for each of us deeply, has put us together to do some things, to study Scripture together, to listen to God's voice, to care for one another and to intentionally, in our small group communities, to serve the world around us. And so, what is maturity? When we talk about being a mature Christian, what does that look like? Very recently, we've been doing some home renovations and some home remodels that's included tearing out some walls. And one of the walls that we tore out was, was uh, adjoining to a door, a doorway that we also took out. And on this doorway, part of the jam was that place that many of you probably have in your house where we've marked off the kids' heights as they had grown up. I looked uh, at the, the first date that we put down there. It was 2003, and there's a little mark where, where Seth was just standing, and we were just able to mark off his height. And all these little marks go at the door frame until we get to 2017. And instead of looking down at, at those little marks, I'm looking up at those marks as my kids have all surpassed me in height. So in doing our renovation, we were going to tear out that wall, tear out that dorm jam. The morning of the tear out, I told the guy leading the project, I said, now listen, we can't lose that part of the door jam. That's very special to our family. Please don't throw that away. Didn't know this, but before we left, my wife also pulled him aside. We cannot lose that door jam. You have to watch over it. And I even, after we left, I sent him a text message, please. And finally, he's like, I got it. Okay, I got it. Good news is we did save that door jam, and now we've, we've installed it into a place of our house, a place of distinction. But here we can see how our children have grown. And so what for us as followers of Jesus, what are marks of maturity? How can we tell if we're really growing? Listen, it's not about your Bible knowledge. 
It's not about your attendance record or how long you've been in a church or been in the church. It's none of that. Maturity, as Jesus defines it, is measured by relationships. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's where we see Christian maturity or not. Sometimes we get into a crisis and we take it out on God or we get into a conflict and we take it out on others. Those are marks of immaturity. So Paul, the same person who wrote, follow me as I follow Christ, he was writing to another church, the church in Galatia. And this church too had, and, and as all churches do, it's so easy to lose your way. It's so easy to lose perspective. And they were, they were starting to adopt things that weren't centered around the gospel. Other things were becoming more important. So Paul writes probably his most blunt letter to the church at Galatia. And in chapter 6, he talks about community. And what he's going to do, we're going to read through this passage here in a minute from Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Uh, he talks about the problems that are inherent in community, and we're going to point out a few of those. But then he talks about the power of what can take place in community as we study Scripture together, as we care for one another, as we serve the world around us. So here is Galatians chapter 6, uh, 1 through 5. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we'll, we'll come back and look at the problems and the power. Okay, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Let every person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. For each person must carry their own load. So I'm going to start with this passage and go through it once, just looking at the potential problems that come up in a church. And really, these are potential problems whenever you get people together, all right? The first he mentions in verse 1 is wrongdoing. Why do we have problems in community? Why do we have problems in church? Sin. Every single person in a church is a sinner. Every single person. Um, Ronald Rollheiser, he, he said this, our friends, love among our friends is defined by, or, or let, me, let me start over again, I'm kind of butchering this, but he says, here's what love looks like, is to forgive somebody again and again and again and again. And, and we often talk about forgiveness in terms of trying to forgive our enemies. You know who we really need to forgive? We need to forgive our friends. Friends are those that we have decided that we will forgive long term. Because we are going to hurt one another. Because we are all sinners. There's going to be wrongdoing. So friends, we, we say, I'm going to forgive you over the long haul. Which might mean multiple times a year, multiple times a day. But a community is going to have to wrestle with wrongdoing. We are all sinners. What do we do? We forgive each other again and again and again and again. One of the other problems, he says, whenever there's wrongdoing, you should restore with a gentle spirit. So one of the things that we see in our lives is how harsh people can be. Listen, there's enough harshness in the world. There's enough harshness out in culture to last many, many lifetimes. The church should not be such a harsh place. Um, recently, I came across my desk a, a a post, a Facebook post from somebody I don't know, but they were posting to the Texas Historical Society. They had vis visited the Comanche County Library in Texas and had discovered some Baptist records from the 1890s. And it was like reading a hot gossip column because here were the records of people who were kicked out of the church and why. Somebody was kicked out of the church for hosting a dance. One person was kicked out of the church for disorderly walking. Now, I don't know what disorderly walking is, but I've probably done that a time or two. Somebody else was kicked out of the church for arguing with a pastor. Now, that one makes perfect sense. I get that one, right? But here is a record of all the people that have been kicked out of the church and why. And there's a sense of churches are harsh. When there is sin, we should be gentle with one another, not passive, but realizing there before the grace of God go I. So there's sin, there's harshness. Another problem in community, if, and this is down in verse 3, if someone considers himself something when he is nothing, 
Whenever you get people together, there's going to be a sense, at least among a few, of I am superior. I am superior to everyone else, right? You know what superiority gives rise to? Stereotyping. It is so easy to see ourselves as a category of one and see everyone else, we kind of lump them together based on a few outward characteristics. Now, stereotyping is a mental shortcut we all use. Uh, before you cast stones at others for being stereotypers, we all do it. It's a mental shortcut because sometimes we don't feel we have the bandwidth to analyze each person individually, so we use some external characteristics and just start lumping people together. We don't want people to treat us like that. And so we need to be careful of treating others like that. So I would even challenge some of you who have, have struggles with the church. Could it be that your struggles are stereotypes? You say, well, I, I went to church once and nobody talked to me. Could it be that you sat down next to somebody that they were a first-time guest to and they were waiting for somebody to talk to them? You say, well, I don't like to go to church because uh, all, those, all those people at First Baptist, they just, they, they, their lives are in order. They look like they've got everything figured out. They've got life together. I can promise you that's not the case. I know these people well, right? And I know me well. I'm a mess most days. Here's the deal. That's, that's stereotyping. And we create those stereotypes to give ourselves excuses. That's a problem that we must deal with in community. Wrongdoing, harshness, stereotypes. And then it says in verse 4, you know, we often compare ourselves to one another. Oh, playing the comparison game. Who is better? Who is stronger? Who is faster? These are problems that are just inherent in any community. Anytime you get people together, these things are going to happen. And if I were to take all four of these problems and lump them together under one title, it would just be this, immaturity. We all, I think for our lifetime, we're going to struggle with immaturity whenever we get into a crisis with God or get into conflicts with other people. We will wrestle with our own immaturity, but that's what community is for. So a very interesting study that came out a few years ago, if you've ever been to the Northeast, you know that Boston Red Sox fans love Boston Red Sox, and they hate the New York Yankees. In fact, parents teach their kids not to wear anything with pinstripes. They have actually taught their kids sometimes to flip off Yankees fans. I mean, there's a deep-seated hatred from the Red Sox to the Yankees. So a study was done to try to identify, do Red Sox fans love their team more or hate the Yankees more? And so they asked the question, how much money would it take for you to root against the Red Sox, to root against your team? And the average answer was $503. Then they asked the question, how much money would it take for you to root for the New York Yankees? And it turned out to be $560. So you see, on that scale, they actually hate the Yankees more than they love their own team. In a church, do we love one another or do we just hate all the other things out there? Is it about hating the other team or loving, genuinely loving one another? And when that happens, we forgive wrongdoing. We tend to be gentle, gentler with those that we love. We don't practice superiority or stereotyping. And we certainly don't try to compete and outcompete one another. There's a genuine love for the community as we grow together. So, these are some of the problems that are just inherent in a community. You're going to find these in any church. And I've seen really great people leave churches over these issues. And Paul says these are problems, but they're also opportunities. Because once we punch through these problems, then what we discover is the potential power of what a community can hold. So I want to go back through Galatians 6 now. And what I want to do is point out two phrases. And maybe it was flagged in your mind what, what on the surface seems to be a contradiction or really two ideas that can be compatible with one another if we understand them properly. So here's two things that are very powerful about community, all right? So let's go to verse 2. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry one another's burdens. Here's the deal. We all carry something different. Every single one of us carries a burden that is unique to us. Now, I'm going to illustrate this. You're probably wondering why I have these paper boxes here. So, what I want to do is just kind of use this as a simple illustration. 
Just imagine every person you know in the world carries a box. Every person in the world you know carries a burden. The thing is, everyone carries a box, but, but we can't see what's in the box. You know, sometimes we see people, they look like they have life together. But really, we're just seeing the surface. We're seeing the outside of the box. We don't know what they're carrying around on the inside. So this box, it, it, I was going to lie to you and say that it, it has pillows in it. It doesn't. It's just empty. And maybe you can tell by the way I'm holding it that it's it's empty box. Some people carry a relatively empty box. Life is good right now. Kids are being born, you know. Uh, job promotion happening. You know, good things. Life is pretty light. But some people you'll meet today, they're going to be carrying a heavier box. Again, it looks the same on the outside. This is identical to the other box. But you can tell maybe by the way that I'm carrying it that it's a little bit heavy. This box contains books. And we really can't see what other people are carrying because everybody carries something different. For you right now, the load might be light, but for you, the load might be heavy. Kids are born, then they grow up to be teenagers, and, and they start driving, and they start staying out late at night, and your, and your parents start to age and start to get ill, and we start to carry around these burdens. Everybody carries something different. And so, because we don't know exactly what everyone's carrying, we need to develop a communal response. This is why we need community. Every person you know is carrying a burden. And probably the only burden you are fully aware of is your own. So what do we do? When we realize that everyone in our community bears a burden, we, we care for one another. C.S. Lewis said this, and I think this is brilliant. Quit worrying about whether you feel love for somebody. Just act as though you do. Uh, and that, that falls in line with my definition of love. Love has nothing to do with feelings. It's the decision to will and to work towards somebody's best interest. Quit worrying about having the feelings of love and just start loving people. Just start acting as though you do. Start bearing one another's burdens. Now, how exactly do we do that? Because if somebody else is carrying a burden, I can't fix it, right? I can't fix their problem. Now, I may be able to contribute in some way, but only they can carry their burden. And here's where we come into the ministry of presence. The ministry of presence. There's a book called A View from a Hearst, and it's about people who have dealt with death and how they have responded in dealing with death. And one father who lost three children in different circumstances, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that weight, that burden? Here's what he said. He said, I was sitting, torn by grief. Somebody came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true, but I was unmoved, except that I wished he would go away. And he finally did. Another person came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour or more. He listened when I had something to say. He answered briefly, prayed simply, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. We often don't know what to say to somebody else who's carrying a burden or somebody who's in a crisis with God or conflict with others. Good news is you don't, know how, you don't have to know what to say. You just practice presence. The most powerful words we can say in community with one another is, I'm here. This is often called incarnational ministry because what, what did Jesus do? God came in the flesh to our earth. And what we do as followers of Jesus is we step from earth into other people's hells and we stay there with them. We practice the ministry of presence. We bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Maturity is about relationships and so we are there for other people. Listen, this is why you need community. Because if you cut yourself off from community, when a crisis comes up, you are doomed to bear the weight by yourself. It doesn't have to be this way. So my encouragement is you're never going to find a perfect group of people, uh, say a community group here in our church. You're never going to find a perfect group that teaches the Bible just the way you want and all the people that you like perfectly, but people are people. Jump in, put down some roots, grow your life, and become mature. So now if you look at this, 
you know, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, then we, we scratch our heads a little bit when Paul gets down to verse 5, for each person must carry his own load. Well, wait, you, you just said bear one another's burdens. Now what are you saying about carrying your own load? So, so get this. Everyone carries something different, a burden, but everyone also carries the same thing. So that picture there for load, or the word load, actually means backpack. It's like a soldier's backpack. Everyone must carry their own load. Everyone must carry their own backpack. So while everyone carries something different, all of us carry the same things, don't we? We all carry concerns for our career. We all carry concerns for our family. We all carry concerns for uh, our relationships and our home life and all these things. We all, whoever you are, you carry those same things. So when it comes to those heavy burdens, we must bear one another's burdens, right? This is the communal response. But when it comes to our, our load, what community teaches us is how to take personal responsibility. Communal response, personal responsibility in learning how to carry the weight of life that we all experience in a Christ-like way. I'm reading a book this week. It's, uh, the, the title's not important, but it's written by Navy SEAL, and he's talking about learning to skydive. Uh, he's rather humorous about this because on several skydiving training missions, uh, Navy SEALs are kind of known for their sense of humor. Um, he, he, he says, if something goes wrong when you're skydiving, your parachute doesn't open, you'll have the rest of your life to figure out what's wrong. <laughs> it's a perfect statement. He said, uh, and, and when, uh, you know, the fear of falling to your death, uh, they, when your parachute doesn't open, they call it death by high-speed dirt. So uh, Navy SEALs humor, not mine, but I do find it funny. But Navy SEALs are trained when they're skydiving, if their parachute doesn't open, to walk through five steps. And I, I, as I was listening to these steps, I thought this is, this is crisis management. This is when something goes sideways in life, and it will, how do you handle that? And so here are the five steps. First of all, assess the situation. Assess the situation. What has happened? Pretty easy. My parachute isn't opening. That's what's happening, right? But you assess what's happening. Second, you determine the problem. Why is the parachute not open? Is, was it packed in a faulty way? Is a wire tangled? So you, you identify the problem, and then you, de you, you determine, or, or you identify there is a problem, then you determine what the problem is. Then the next three steps, you decide how to solve it. What do I need to do to solve this problem? You make a decision, then you implement that decision, you actually do it, and then you evaluate, did that work? If it did, shoot opens, you're great. If it doesn't, you go through those five steps again. You assess the problem. You determine what to do. So you go through that. That's what community is about. That when we face a crisis with God and uh, we face conflict with others, we're, we're all carrying this load. We're all carrying a backpack. And in a way, it's like our own parachute. And, and when something goes wrong, we, we tell one another, here's what you need to do. You need to bear your own load on this. You need to assess the situation. You need to determine what's wrong. You need to make a decision. You need to implement that. And then you need to evaluate if that works. We teach each other in community how to carry our own load. What is this? This is maturity. Maturity is measured by Christ and by Christians as how we deal with relationships. And so that's why I want to encourage every person within our church every person within your church to be connected in with the community, to study the Scripture together. Why? Because we believe that God still speaks, and God can speak to us through the Scripture. Uh, I'm going through a challenging time right now in, in church leadership, and I really need to be listening to God at this moment. But if I had waited to listen to God at this moment, I would be in a bad way. All the years I've been listening to God has led up to now. And so I prepare when times are good, uh, I practice listening to God when times are good so that I'm prepared when times are bad. We listen to Scripture together. We carry when we care for one another. That means that we carry one another's burdens. We also teach each other how to carry our own loads in a mature way. So we, we care for each other, and then we serve a world beyond ourselves. 
I believe every community group should have some kind of missional action they take to remind that group and themselves individually that the world doesn't center around me. The world is centered around Jesus Christ, and we are going to serve his needs wherever we find them. So I alluded to this at the beginning, that as I've watched my kids grow up, those marks on that, on that board have, have gone higher than my head. And so now my boys, and we kind of do this chest bumping thing every time they come home from school, they, they come home and they stand in front of me and they kind of bump their chest against mine and, and they look down at me and I'm looking at their chin. And what I'll say to them is the same thing. I, I'll say, you may be taller than me on the outside, but I am taller than you on the inside. As your pastor, this is what I want us to see. This is who I want us to be. I want us to be tall on the inside. And whatever we look like on the outside, to grow in maturity, to grow taller on the inside, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to genuinely love one another as we ourselves want to be loved. May God give us that maturity that can only come from a relationship with Him. Let's pray together. God, thank you that, uh, that you call us to be better than what we are. Wherever we are, however long we've lived on this planet, you call us to greater maturity. And so I pray that for myself. I, I pray that for the people listening to this today. And it all starts with you, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That inner transformation that then gives way to outer transformation and loving others as we want to be loved. Help us to become that kind of people. Our world desperately needs salt and light right now, not smoke and mirrors. And help us to have a positive impact in the world because you've made a difference in our lives. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we offer our prayer. Amen. If you need community, first thing you need is Christ. We need a relationship with him. If you've never said yes to Jesus before, he is waiting for that simple response from you. Yes. Yes. If you're ready to be a part of a church, if you're ready to make a spiritual decision today, just jump over to our uh, website, TulsaFBC.org. On the opening of that page, there's a button, I've made a decision. Email will come to me. We'll follow up with you from our ministerial staff team to pray for you and to help you make those next decisions in your relationship with the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may God grant you peace both now and forever. Amen.